to connecting to cloud server and we are now recording live at backdrop cms live Great. a lot of a lot of words in there so i'm gonna share my desktop over here all right can you see this thing that says that there is a presentation to kick this off yeah yes awesome all right, we have had our first technical success of the evening. Yes. To everyone that's going to watch this afterwards, we had many epic fails on the way here, but there won't be any more epic fails. So this is Hacks the Backdrop CMS, or as I like to say, a call for web unity. So um, my name is Brian Olendike, or at BTO Pro. I've got this stupid goggles on my head and this hat, so it makes it easier to find me at conferences. And remember, at some point, we will all attend a conference once again. <laughs> um, but I'm also known as EdTech Joker um, because I use my technologies in the classroom that I teach in. So I get to teach uh, currently one course at Penn State. Um, it's the second course that I've been kind of hacking, and I do say hacking on purpose, I take the curriculum, throw it out, and then make people use Hack CMS and contribute to it. <laughs> okay, so uh, what is hacks that you're forcing people to contribute to through their curriculum? Uh, so as quickly as possible, because it's like had whole events about it. Um, hacks is a community of users and developers, uh, people from different organizations, primarily Penn State, because that's just where we where it's founded. So a lot of these faces are for people at Penn State, um, in which we're building towards any platform being something that can leverage our, our innovations. Um, so I work in a department that helps support online education. And we started in Drupal, in Drupal 5 actually forever ago. Um, and then what we were finding is we could only collaborate so far with people. Um, and then when the, the great rift of D7 to D8 uh, took its toll, we're still sitting on D7. Um, and we invested our energy somewhere else. So this is that somewhere else. Um, so web components are for everyone. And I will say, let's build this future together. And if you take literally nothing else away from this entire conversation, it's that. Please adopt web components so that we can work together in the future. So what are web components? I'm going to boil it down to five slides. It has tons of blog posts, usually angry ones if you're in the React community, that you can Google and find out more information about this. But effectively, uh, the, the major browser vendors got together and said, if we support these four core pieces of the spec, if we support adding a new tag called an HTML template tag, uh, custom elements, which means developers can define their own HTML tags that are valid in the browser. Uh, we can use Shadow DOM, which allows us to encapsulate things. And if we have a common standard for getting that data to show up on the screen or ES modules, uh, then we can support what is known as web components. Uh, at the end of last year, all the major browsers uh, support web components. It has on a normal page load, probably 93 plus percent of global traffic is going to hit it. Um, you can compile back to IE 11 if you need to, but everybody's starting to drop support for that big time. So um, they're distributed via NPM JS or GitHub. Um, but if you're used to other front end development, Frameworks, you know, you can run things like npm install and then the name of the repo and hey, you end up getting this new custom element. So usually these custom element definitions boil down to a single file. And so in the case of this, we have a video hyphen player. If we want to make a brand new HTML tag called video hyphen player and the browser to understand that, we have the definition written in JavaScript in a single file, in this case called video hyphen player. And you can see in it, it actually is able to reference and pull in other code. So this is the ES modules portion of the standard that is now available native to all browsers that we can import and have a new way for JavaScript files to resolve each other. So everything extends from baked into the in the browser, there is now a JavaScript class called HTML element. And because of this little class, everything extending from it implies that it's all compatible. So whether it's written in uh, lit element or polymer element, skate.js, svelte, uh, stencil, no matter what thing you see out there that says it does web components, it's going to be compatible with anything else that says it does web components because of this. So when you get it in the DOM, uh, shadow DOM, while a optional thing to opt into, 
um, if you're not familiar with what Shadow DOM is, it allows you to scope your CSS tighter to what the thing is that you're working on. So in this case, Video Player, if you were to inspect the DOM in one of our pages and you'd see Video Player, you will get this little shadow root. Now this is something native to the browser already. If you have a video tag and you have shadow roots enabled to be able to visualize them for a while, you can actually unpack what a video tag is in the browser and see the guts that make up a video tag. Um, but the big deal with it is that this CSS is valid and only scope to the things underneath the element in question. So you can write way simpler CSS. Again, it's, it's a controversial decision um, to scope this and it's kind of self-contained, but it's an opt-in type of a thing and there are ways to pierce it. Um, so what is Hacks? Hacks is a web component that is H hyphen A hyphen X that work, sits in the DOM. Its definition is web components and it is extended by and written through other web components. So in the picture here, Hacks is on the interface and it makes this area editable, kind of like a content editable or like what you'd expect from a CK editor. But this video tag is actually video hyphen player. And so that tag doesn't require hacks to work. We can make tags that have nothing to do with hacks and have the exact same workflow as building any website, take a design asset and then wire it up to hacks in like a minute. So hacks is a next generation WYSIWYG. Uh, it's built on web components. It ultimately edits and saves HTML. And because web components are HTML, we can save those. Um, and it works across platforms. So its goal is to empower all systems in a platform agnostic way. I don't care if it's Backdrop or Drupal or has a multi-billion dollar company backing it or six people that are on a Zoom call. It's worth supporting because it has the web at its core. Um, we're also trying to solve common accessibility issues at scale. Web components are a great way to solve accessibility gotchas um, as well as have the accountability to fix them after the fact. Uh, internally, we're focused on institutional staff and making sure that they can focus on educating and not learning HTML and different CMS quirks. Um, historically, we were teaching people how to use CK Editor, write class structure, or how to use Drupal site building, God forbid. Um, instead, we're giving them a WYSIWYG, drag and drop type experience that we can actually sustain innovation in. So it's lock-in free. You can migrate away from it at any time as a core function of what we're doing. And because it's built on web components, it liberates us so that if this content, which is in this case an HTML blob in Helm's Learning Network, which is built in Drupal 7, I want it to be able to work uh, without issue in backdrop. That's a just core tenet of what it is we're building. Everything has to work everywhere else. So because we build on web components and web components are a layer below traditional frameworks, we're compatible with every content management system and every front end development framework. Now, some people will say that this nasty little React logo behaves a little differently, but let's ignore that. It is largely compatible. Uh, so not hacks the backdrop. That is not, I, I screwed up. It's not actually hacks the backdrop. I don't care about your community. Ha ha. I care about all communities. So hacks is about getting into and uniting all of the different tribes, all these different PHP, non-PHP, Node.js. Your users don't care. They want to use a website, generate accessible code, and go back to whatever other interesting thing they were doing. So yes, Backdrop is also in this because Backdrop is on the web. Ta-da! So now I do care. So hacks integrations that are out there, there's a bajillion links in these this slide decks, so you can go to them later, but we support WordPress, Drupal, multiple versions, Backdrop, Grab CMS, Eleventy, uh, and Hack CMS. So I know what you're thinking right now, plant in the audience, and thank you, Tim, for, for asking this question. I know uh, you said it in the back, uh, chat, and I somehow got it onto a slide instantly. How is it possible to support any platform? And I, that's nice of you to, act, to pose that straw man question. Allow me to set it on fire right now. So introducing the magic script, okay? And what you do with the magic script is you just put this nice little hat on the backdrop dragon and poof, it magically knows how to talk to web components. And if it sounds ridiculous, don't worry, it is about that easy. So there is a repo we made, it's called Unbundled Web Components. I did a, a show, we have a show occasionally um, on Fridays and uh, I kind of stumbled up upon this approach that I was like whiteboarding one day. It's effectively a repository that allows you to compile web components in a way that it references the file still. 
And so by referencing the direct file for that video hyphen player or for a backdrop hyphen logo that I'll show later, uh, you're able to repurpose that element over and over again across applications. So what this magic script does is, uh, so for example, if you went to btopro.com, which is my personal blog, it's built on top of Hack CMS, and you viewed source, you'd see the magic script, but you wouldn't know it. So at the bottom of the page, there's a reference to, in this case, uh, this cdn.waxim.io slash build.js. That file is able to automatically discover and hydrate any web component definition it knows about. The Unbundle Build script allows you to basically pre-program, here's the tags that I want users to be able to use. And so this approach is heavily primed towards content management system audiences, and I will not move off of it um, for my own purposes because it makes my life so easy. So um, we push this out to a CDN, and then any tag, and, and this, this uh, my coworker Nikki put this together, this is our storybook. You can go check out webcomponents.psu80, you see all of the elements in our storybook. Um, so in this example that she has, it says, oh, well now add relative hyphen heading to a page. And any page anywhere on the internet that will allow this script to execute is going to correctly put the relative heading tags web component definition into the page. Meaning you can use the relative heading tag meaning you can use the relative heading tag across platforms. So uh, there's, this is a very complicated approach. I broke it down in a dev.2 article. It's like seven series long. It's about 30 minutes worth of writing, uh, just going through the documentation if you care. Um, but you can see it any number of places. So there's a code pen um, where I have this loaded in. And because that little snippet is there with that one line, placing music hyphen player in the page makes a music player show up. Why? Because there's a web component named music hyphen player. The script detects that automatically populates the definition. Same with the Twitter embed. Uh, so then we throw this into other products. So like we don't actually own sites.psu.edu. Um, it's a vendor controlled WordPress system, but we can load JavaScript. And if you can load one line of JavaScript, you can unlock the web components magic script capabilities. So uh, for example, I wrote this post the other day, it's called more sarcasm. Um, it was basically a dare uh, to make a sarcasm tag and I documented you know, how it works. And in the page you'd see, oh, okay, there's in this code pen, there's more hyphen sarcasm. And the, the funness of more sarcasm is the world needs more sarcasm. <laughs> and anything you put between the more sarcasm tag, in this case, you see there's HTML is so easy. It will do this little up and down thing that is kind of like becoming a meme standard. Um, so because we don't have a real sarcasm tag, well, I made a sarcasm tag. And you'd say, but okay, so I don't like, so you made a sarcasm tag. Awesome. So I didn't make the, the big deal. I didn't make a sarcasm tag for backdrop. I didn't make a sarcasm mm -hmm. tag for Drupal. I didn't make it for WordPress. I didn't make it for anything specific. I made it work on the internet. And mm -hmm. because it works on the web and it's a web component, that means it automatically via the magic script works in Elm's Learning Network. The thing that is the reason why I get paid, which is nice. Mm -hmm. It's a Drupal 7 learning management system I built a long time ago. Um, obviously because it's a Drupal 7, but then that means all the hacks capabilities, all of any tag, you know, that more sarcasm tag, we can use that in Elm's Learning Network or Drupal 7. So this is a, a community site that we maintain. It's, well, we've maintained it less because we don't use Drupal as much, but Drupal.psu.edu, we take our assets, we take that more sarcasm tag, we push it up to our content delivery network. We have the magic script in place and now it's available here or it's available in Drupal 8 and 9, or it's available in classic press, you know, slash WordPress, whatever, whichever one you use, because the magic script works anywhere, which mm -hmm. drastically reduces the amount of time we have to invest in the actual integrations with those databases and platforms. So we do have a module for every single one of these platforms. We even have our own, we have a backdrop CMS one, uh, which we'll show a little bit later. So because of this, because we're so decoupled and headless to be able to do this, it's freed up so much time. We're working on our own content management system. So this is an example of what it's, what it's able to do. Um, this is odl.science.psu.edu. It takes a while to load because we still have to clean up some performance things, but it is a gorgeous website built in Hack CMS. 
And if you look inside it, what's a, what to me is such a big deal about this is we have reusable components that are specific to Hack CMS in this case. So we have a theme that's ODL Hacks theme, and then we have page top bar. Page top bar works anywhere. ODL Hacks theme, if we publish that out to our CDN, it works anywhere. So we use Hack CMS uh, for online education primarily. So this is a course that we teach at Penn State, right? It's got navigation on the side, people engage in content, woohoo. But it's so easy to build using Hacks and what Hack CMS is providing that we're starting to roll this out to students and we basically give them like, here's two minutes of training and they can build websites. They've told me in my class, they've told me multiple times, like I didn't actually think I could build a website and this has made it very approachable. It doesn't look beautiful, but I've made something. Mm -hmm. um, so we have, um, this is my course, just so you have, again, this is a link arm, right? So my course, uh, which is IST402 in this case, and I have SpongeBob and SpongeBob is asking, are you ready? And I've got three SpongeBobs on here. But what's going on with SpongeBob and why you should care is SpongeBob is a meme maker tag so that I can meme on top of images that already exist and a grid plate tag. So meme maker is a silly tag, whatever, but grid plate allows for responsive design in a platform and design agnostic way. So we just use the grid plate everywhere and you can see it's pretty readable here that has a layout that's a four by four by four because we go off of a 12 grid if i would change that to be three by three by three by three i'd get four columns but hacks is able to edit those tags so this is my ic 210 course and when i log in i see a nice little bar down the side and i want to edit this page and now it's editable because i'm using the h hyphen a hyphen x tag i click i make modifications i hit save and what i'm saving is html so we don't care that it's Hacks CMS. We just care that Hacks is putting out HTML and then we consume that and spit it to a, a static HTML page in our case. So Hacks CMS is gonna make uh, the next jump and it already has started to into Elms. And so um, this matters for the rest of the platform <laughs> because we're gonna start using any platform as a backend to Hacks CMS if it outputs the right schema. So this is a core, this is a page in one of our courses. It's, they've looked this way forever. It's unthemable because it's written in like Zurb Foundation. It's terrible to, to work with. This is it headless. So this is Hack CMS loading up a Drupal 7 node using Drupal 7 as a backend. And it really wasn't that hard to write. Uh, we have a standard way that we present outline data called JSON outline schema. It's basically stolen directly from the way that Drupal does books. And so that's the way Backdrop does books. But you can see uh, traces of it here, right? With the menu system. So you see MLID, right? And you see the slug is node, right? So uh, we basically punched a, a pathway into Drupal to get its data out in an outline form. So then we can pump it into a front end and make it look pretty and fast. So this is not a talk about hack CMS, but it is starting to catch on and it's taking us other places in other directions. It's only possible because we're headless with everything. Um, so we've actually started to see some traction in government around this. Um, I'm having conversations, I believe on Tuesday with another agency, um, but uh, the National Archives uh, actually contributed uh, some UX research formally to, to Hacks and made it look a heck of a lot better and easier to use. Um, so they walked a bunch of their uh, content contributors through it, uh, asked what this doesn't do, what it needs to do. And we got like really good feedback from a wider net than just me in academia. So um, in exchange, the little, you know, um, trade of like, hey, you gave me some knowledge and information. Here's some knowledge and information. Um, they're actually using the unbundled builds project on certain web properties. And so this is the NARA hyphen branding hyphen bar. And so whenever they want to put down the National Archives logo, they now have a tag that they can just add to any web property and they get it. They don't care if it's Backdrop or Drupal or whatever. So then if they want to go to a different website, uh, and just to prove that there, there is a lot of reuse here, Simple Modal is a tag that my coworker made. So they said, oh, well, we, we need an accessible modal to present this information. We have one. You take the tag, and so you, you're able to use web components in other web components. So once you learn how to make one, you can leverage any other tag that's out there in the open. Our team has produced over 400 that are open. 
Uh, so pre UX audit with NARA, hacks look like garbage. And post UX audit with NARA, hacks looks significantly better. And the critical thing here is our content still works because those are design assets. We design these assets to function a certain way. Hacks just learns how to edit the different properties of those assets. So Hacks has vendors as well. Um, you can deploy us in Reclaim Hosting or Reclaim Cloud. Um, so there's a button in their cPanel instance and you can see Hacks CMS and click to install. Um, they are really about the uniting message of Hacks. So they're starting to actually roll out in page uh, options to say, oh, hey, you're installing Grab CMS. Oh, do you wanna use hacks by default? Um, so I wanna try and work with them to get like Backdrop there, Classic Press, any platform, and then also have the, hey, do you wanna use hacks button? Even if you don't use it, it helps support all of our projects in my opinion. So um, we actually started having events pre-COVID. Um, so we had our first hacks camp in, uh, at Duke University in October. Uh, so almost a year ago now. Um, so we had like 45 people, talked a lot about web components, almost exclusively about web components. We actually talked very little about hacks. Um, so that's kind of my call to action piece, um, pitch to this community, as well as the classic press community. I'm glad to see that you have a, a conversation going on between you two. Um, I don't think we all need like these siloed individual types of things uh, when we get back to real life, you know, get back to in-person types of things. Buildings are expensive, Tra conferences are expensive to plan. I think that there's a message that can be had around uniting beyond more than just the tribes that exist around these different web frameworks. And so Hacks Camp, we talked mostly about web components and other people's components and CMSs and design libraries. Yeah, Drupal came up in some talks. Yeah, some people showed Hacks CMS. Yeah, some people show Drupal sites, but those two groups could actually collaborate together for the first time because they were agreeing upon using web components and saying, hey, we're gonna use the web standard. It's just like how you can go to a, a WordPress or a Drupal event and see a talk about CSS and go, oh, well, I use CSS. I should be able to know how to, to interface with this conversation. Instead of getting lost in like layout editor, do you use panels, you know, gobbledygook, keeping all those UI and UX decisions agnostic of platform, I think will benefit all of us more in the end. So if you wanna learn more about web components and just getting started, getting into tooling, I highly recommend open-wc.org. Um, I think it's by far the, the best community resource in this space. Um, we've contributed some, we, we take some stuff from there too. They, they do really good work. Um, or um, Polymer Project, which is by Google. They have a really good try Polymer, or sorry, try Lit Element site. Um, so if you search for Lit Element, Lit Element is the successor to Polymer. If you ever heard of Polymer, if you haven't heard of Polymer, then you don't care. Um, but Lit Element is a very small base class element that gives you some nice, um, some nice enhancements on top of, of normal web components or vanilla. Um, so, we are all web builders. It doesn't matter what we're building. We're ultimately building the web and building experiences for people. For people, So I feel like regardless of where we create those things or what we're creating, we should be trying to build those things together. We shouldn't be stuck in like some system is backend is written in PHP and another's is in Node and that's why we can't collaborate on the front end. It doesn't make any sense. But yet there's tons of like Angular plus Node.js plus something, and Angular plus, you know, design framework plus Drupal. Like, that's just kind of silly to me. So um, with that, that's all I had for actual, like, slide deck. Um, I did want to, I have a, um, an example backdrop site up running hacks. Um, and I also have a backdrop hyphen logo that I threw together about 20 minutes before, before we started. Um, so does anybody have any questions before I would do either of those or want to talk about something else or see examples of web components? This isn't, I, it unfortunately hacks is like a really complicated topic to just be like, I'm going to just sure. talk about this. Well, let's have a discussion. Well, I'd like to see what your samples are here and then I'll have questions. Okay. Yeah, I think I might yeah, be able to form better questions after the demo. <laughs> okay. So, um, so for starters, I have, I just have a, a backdrop site up in DDEV and I don't think I've actually done anything other than adding 
do we hacks module? Yeah, I have the hacks module. So a hacks module has a headless form system, which then makes it easier for me to integrate with other things. But so um, I pick my CDN. Now the CDN in this case could just be my site, right? So sites, all libraries, web components. In this case, this is me running the unbundled builds um, set up and saying, hey, here's all the components that I want. When we do that, um, this interface will siphon off all the tags that you load in, no matter what they are, and then present them to you. So you can say, oh, well, I really want, you know, and these, these tags I don't believe work in backdrop, but these were Drupal specific tags to go and say like remote render that block. But let's turn those off because we're not gonna use them as in this, right? So I've got a date card, um, a glossary of terms, the hacks logo, there's all image comparison, a hero image, sticky notes, maybe you don't care about math, maybe you care about vocabulary and abbreviations. In these, I can click and some of them have demos. I think I can actually tell, say, oh yeah, only filter things by demos. So I can see, okay, there's a side note and I can see a demo and it's this little pop-up or little demo here. I can see a license. So that's what that tag would look like. I can pop it up if I need to see it out of context. I use memes all over the place, memes a little smaller, so I pop it up and it says I bring you the death fun times, right? And I'll do Twitter embed, sure, and music player. So what I'm doing is I'm setting up what hacks is allowed, what users are allowed to edit and place on the page in hacks. We need to clean up some of these other aspects of this page, but you can also put in, and I don't care if people see these keys, so don't worry about it. <laughs> um, you can put in keys for different API providers so that you can actually search these through the front end, get the results, and then just drag and drop them into your site. Um, as much as possible, I try to keep things out of whatever the platform in question is. All right, so I'll go to my first post. Um, I'll go to the block editor mode. I get hacks loaded up. So this is in two columns. I've got this little thing where I can drag and drop this around. So I could take this paragraph and move it in there. Um, if I wanted to make this three column, it's really hard. I hit the button and now it's three columns. And um, as I mentioned before, the big deal with our grid system is that this grid system, all the content in it, this is just gonna get saved back to your body field, but it's, it's platform agnostic, right? So the definition for grid plate is not owned by any one platform. If you had a different definition of grid plate, you could actually hydrate the tag to be your definition. Um, if this was, you know, if, if there's anyone that would have questions or concerns about like accessibility of this, cause it's JavaScript first or SEO, those questions are melting away more and more every, every few months to be perfectly honest. Um, so let's say I want to make that an H3, um, I could duplicate it. Uh, let's open up my panel with all the fun stuff. So this, this section here, I'm going to delete this, um, or actually I'll move my image up here. And then I'm gonna delete this article. I'll show you how I got that in there. So I've got the backdrop CMS Wikipedia, which I'm really glad is, is a real thing. Um, so I've got multiple ways I can do that. Over here, I've got my add content section. Um, so we've got add content. This is when you have an element selected where the settings are. Um, and then I can also search. So I could search Wikipedia or NASA from here. Again, those are things that can be turned off and whatever, but it's just for demonstration. So I can say backdrop CMS which is gonna search Wikipedia and then I can drag and drop uh, that in here. Now, when I drag and drop it in here, because I have said that I want people to be able to render content using the Wikipedia uh, hyphen article tag, it says, well, I could put it in the page as a link or do you wanna use this article? So you're, we're not locking people into any of our tag ecosystem. So I can say Wikipedia article and now what I have in the page is a Wikipedia hyphen query tag, right? And it's, we're basically treating the DOM as an API, right? So you have Wikipedia query and I could switch this to Drupal and it's gonna rewrite and that tag is only in charge of the definition of whatever it's doing. So yes, it happens to search Wikipedia, but it's that idea of being able to pinprick the DOM and tweak what's there and it actually updates. So if I say, hey, that layout is a one, 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 grid plate is in charge of that. However, if I go in here and I remove a column, you'll see that it, removing a column, hacks is just modifying that value and saying, oh, you want two column? Well, I'll just take away part of that and this is what the grid plate is. So um, 
hacks is siphoning the settings off of the tags in question, right? So it knows this is an image. Um, so I can take my little funny hat and we'll put the hat down there. But then when I switch to the Wikipedia tag, it knows this is a Wikipedia tag and the Wikipedia tag has said, these are what the settings are. So if I wanted to via the UI, change this to backdrop CMS, then we can set it back to backdrop and I can hide the title if I don't want the title in there. This settings form is dictated by the design asset saying this is the way that you can interface with me. Uh, Hacks doesn't know anything about the tags it's gonna place on the page. So if I wanna go to me looking super sure of himself, obviously, um, and I wanna change that, well, I, because I'm sharing, this is why I took it before. So we have support for things like, hey, that's an upload field and it's gonna be an image. Well, let's just use the camera on the front end, take the picture, upload it to whatever the back end is. That's stuff that has nothing to do with Backdrop or any other platform, but yet you'll find tons of like Drupal video upload field, blah, blah, blah. Like you just wanna get the stupid image up there. That doesn't matter. So it won't let me access my camera because I'm sharing the screen currently. But if I did upload, I can go select some other file. There's that SpongeBob meme that I was messing with. And that actually uploaded to Backdrop's, you know, backend system there. So um, I can then save the page. And now we've got SpongeBob there. Uh, we've got tons of tags. It's kind of like a, you know, random walk to be perfectly honest of what the tags are. We've also got some other niceties like um, me copy and paste a YouTube video. So, if it detects that I, and I just put this in recently, if I paste YouTube into here, uh, it goes, wow, well, okay, yeah, you want the text there. But then if it's on it's a, st a line by itself and I paste, it'll escalate that and go, oh, hey, does anything know how to render YouTube? And in this case, the video player tag put its hand up, so to speak, and said, I can handle that. And so instead of presenting you the link, we do this little UX trick where we go, oh, well, you probably mean this. Now you could always take it and convert it to something else. Um, there's the ability to, because we're treating the front end as data, I can basically take this and kind of rewire it to anything else in the specific instance of a YouTube video that doesn't make a whole ton of sense. Um, but you know, like if I wanted to convert it to a license, it will attempt to take the, the values and map them. Um, now in this case, this would be like YouTube video on backdrop. Source link might be that YouTube video. Uh, let's change it to CC and I like, and it's by Ryan Olenbeck, right? So we can get this live editing type of functionality, but no matter what tag we make, all we're doing is we're modifying the web components in the DOM. And then it's updating and showing you, showing you what's there. So I've got some other, other little things you can, you know, get in and modify classes and stuff like that. Um, we have some other, uh, a lot of tags that are kind of, more Penn State specific, if you will. I end up showing meme a lot because people can at least get what that is. Um, so these tags are, you know, completely customizable to what the environment is. We have, you know, probably 80 or so that are possible. And then it's kind of a coming up with what the default set is that people care about. Um, the way that we actually take those and wire them up to things um, to see what one of those definitions looks like. So like in the case of Wikipedia query, um, just to illustrate that this really doesn't have a lot to do with hacks. The only thing that mentions hacks anywhere in Wikipedia query is this uh, static function. So any design asset that wants to be hacks capable exposes this function. And then hacks at runtime, because I went through that back end form and said, hey, these are the elements that we're allowed to use. It's saying, oh, these are the elements that I can modify. So that definition is coming from the back end. But then on the front end, the element itself is telling hacks in real time, I should be presented as a Wikipedia article. Uh, if someone, you know, drag and drops, like how I drag and drop that in the page, um, I'm able to handle things that claim their Wikipedia. Um, then for what the form is, right, where it said the search term and I changed it from backdrop to Drupal, configure, uh, this is an abstraction of a standard called JSON schema. So um, this is a property, it's mapped to search. Uh, the title to show people is article name, input method is a text field. So um, we actually have a tag called simple, simple fields um, that Nikki wrote, so we can do headless forms. Um, we don't need to do any of this. We can do back end, you know, 
preparing of forms and whatnot, but um, this will just generate, this is enough to generate a form that's front end validated at least. Obviously you'd want to do it on the back end too, but um, so the other thing I wanted to show was, um, it's a backdrop logo that I made real quick just to step through what an element is. So I took, um, this is kind of the way we end up working with any web component um, is you fire up the boilerplate and the boilerplate will stamp out just like, hey, you can get a demo. So for this demo, I made a tag and then used it like a bajillion times so we could just see what one of the potential reasons to use this is, right? So I made a backdrop logo and it's whatever I want. Right, and so we get that updating because I updated the property. Now that aspect is to me, what is so appealing about web components? That doesn't, that type of thing doesn't natively work. This is part of what like lit element is giving you is just as far as that one-to-one, -one, you can make vanilla JavaScript do this one-to-one -one, um, and be just as responsive. But um, I just like using lit element because it's, it's a little cleaner. So what you end up doing in a lit element, which again, this lit element is then having somewhere like class lit element extends HTML element. Um, you can say, here's the CSS and it'll make sure that this CSS is scoped directly to it. So an awesome thing about shadow DOM, right? I can just say like, hey, the IMG tag that you're gonna find, this is the CSS to apply. You don't have class selector hell basically, or like, oh crap, we switched from bootstrap to fill in the blank and now all of these class names need to change. Um, then, and this is a lit element convention, um, you have properties. So I'm saying there's a title and there's invert and invert is a Boolean and you should reflect it, which means make sure that when the attribute is updated, that it's updated here. Um, the other nice thing with reflecting in this super simple example is you can do a host selector. So host in CSS is then me, right? So like the backdrop logo tag, when I have the invert, attribute on me, then apply this CSS filter. So instead of, you know, in this case, I saw that there was like a backdrop logo inverse. So I actually just took this from the top of the backdrop live website. So I took the HTML, I copied the CSS in here. Um, and then as a result, I'm just rendering it out based on what this little snippet is. And then I can take the logo and I can say, okay, well, invert it or not, right? And then it applies that CSS selector, however it wants, right? So then even simple use cases like that, um, we actually have a ton of elements on our web components um, dot PSU dot edu, whoops, web components dot PSU dot edu, not whatever that is, um, site. So we have a storybook instance up there, tells you how to get started with the CDN. Obviously from a, you know, project sustainability standpoint on, on your end or on implementing for any client, you're not gonna use the Penn State CDN, I get that, but it's the approach that's important there. Um, so we have a lot of our elements documented there, you can play around with. Um, Hacks isn't up there yet, but a lot of the other ones are. So that's kind of everything that I had planned. Um, I know we, kicked off late but what do you yeah i think tim had to drop because he's got other sessions to manage but i've got some i've got a question for you <laughs> uh so uh with all of this uh um being markup driven you know that it's all like saving and working in html and that's its strength um what happens when you still have a highly structured site that you need to collect a lot of meta information like let's say you're you know, building out a conference website and you need to include like the start and end time so that you can build out the calendar, you know, like how would you recommend just, uh, fixing the discrepancy between like the X editor to build out the front end content versus like the storage of back end data? Would you like duplicate that information and use one for display or would you parse out what had been put into hacks or we just manage them separately with like normal like backdrop fields, what so, approach would you advise? So um, yeah, that's kind of the like structured data, which is the power, the strength of our platforms historically. I'll say our, cause I'm a Drupal person in this case. Um, <laughs> the strength of our CMSs is, is that data um, structuring process. So this is actually part of why I tell people like 
the thing you should focus on and care about is web components. Hacks can be ancillary to that. Because until you get like the, the major wins with web components of saying like, oh, so you've got that conference time, right? Start time. Well, there's a time elements um, element that's made by GitHub. That's how they present their time. Most of GitHub now is web components. Most people don't seem to know, but um, the, uh, the time, right? So it's just like time ago or whatever it is, right? That's done on the front end now. So instead of rendering on the back end, they just spit out a Unix timestamp and it goes in there. Well, that's still stored in a database in a field, presumably, right? So um, where we actually started with this is we were just hollowing out our, you know, TPL and twig files. So we were taking those and then instead of outputting a bunch of divs and nothingness, we were outputting the time elements field. So then where hacks comes in is, um, and Red Hat hasn't picked up what we're doing, but they keep, they check in and ask questions like every few months. Um, their main interest is in driving a, a golden spike as they see it to say, our design team makes these assets. Maybe they mock up what a date card is. And a date card has a time because it's when the event starts. But then some content contributor in a large project wants to use that date element in what we would normally just call a blob of content. And they're left with like, oh, copy a whole bunch of divs and hope it works still. So um, I, don't, I don't think it necessarily gets rid of that. I think it helps the developer. It also um, allows for some additional options. Right? There's some nice stuff as far as pages that maybe you don't have to turn into blocks everywhere hell. <laughs> um, I, we have also had a request um, from NARA previously to allow for editing other fielded content simultaneously. Um, so I think that would start to come in more to the, um, everything we show and push is platform agnostic, but at DrupalCon Nashville, which was forever ago now, it feels like, um, I demonstrated like what a views tag would look like. So, oh, I have this content, I wanna render a view here. Well, that's heavily, highly structured data. Um, or I want to render a block here. If we had a tag that helped broker that relationship, you know, did the lazy loading remotely and then said, oh, hey, here's the content for this. Um, I think that's part of how we can get our structured content into the blob of content in a more sane way. Um, now, as far as like, yeah, I, I'm how you actually curious about and... editing it. Yeah, because you're creating a lot of content and hacks just like I'm kind of dropping components. I'm typing my articles, I'm typing the conference session details, you know, but I'm building up this page, but where do I put the conference, the session time, you know, mm. like, uh, yeah, like, like how does Hex complement or like, how can it su supplant or, or how can you just get structured data into Hex and then save it into a fielded system so that you can use it to like sort the agenda, you know? That would be a really interesting thing to try and fix. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it feels like like that's the next, right? If you had a tag that was like, um, if you had tags that were mapped to the fields in your system and you said, oh, I'm going to put a date down, but it's actually the date that's tied to, you know, that node or whatever. And mm -hmm. then when you edit it, that when it saves, you should have enough because of the cement, how semantic the HTML is to be like, oh, hey, there's that identifier and then update the field. Yeah, you could potentially use hex like as a purely, I'm editing the body like it is right now, but on save, it's like, oh, is there a time element in here? I'm gonna scan it and then also save that into this field and then have hex is still controlling everything presentational, but like providing shortcuts to save in your structured data that you still need separated out. I don't know. I just <laughs> No, yeah. I mean and and honestly like these vision questions is where I'm like just try to get one button in the backdrop or something. You know, like replace one dip, you know, sc it scratch one itch like old Drupal language, right? Like fix one admin screen or fix one button somewhere and get the workflow down and then go like, oh, well, we can now repurpose that over here and we could repurpose this over here. And the, the weird thing, particularly with the unbundled builds approach, you actually end up shipping uh, less content to people. So particularly mm -hmm. over larger sites, 
because it's a progressive load. Once you already have like the relative heading tag, which are relative heading tag, um, if you put 10 of them on the screen it, and you say, this is a subheading, it'll figure out based on DOM hierarchy, oh, I should actually start at H2 instead of H1. So avoiding an accessibility error that the front end user just using CK editor might not realize, oh, your theme layer has a, a H1 in it. So um, skipping on things like that, those tags are in the page. Well, you go to the next page as relative heading and because of the way that the, the ES module standard works, it sees that definition in those files right at the top with like the import da da da, and it just skips it. It goes, oh, I already have that in local cache. So it's kind of like you pay a little bit up front as far as what those things are, but then every subsequent page you go to, that stuff is just free, um, which then you also send less code from the back end and do less logic over and over again because it's more, you know, it's unpacking, oh, it's a relative heading. Well, it's actually like a blob of HTML and CSS, but now you're not writing it all the time in the backend templating system. Yep. Yeah. yeah, I wonder um, also the approaches that you could use, um, like this kind of hybrid thing where, where Backdrop is still like your database. It's still storing the, the, the stuff in the backend because uh, web components are not still has to save into a location somewhere. Um, configuring the other aspects of content, but using hacks as like a replacement for your WYSIWYG editor, like it would be like, uh, I know hacks is like very much, a, very much WYSIWYG more than just about any other so-called WYSIWYG, right? Cause it's literally <laughs> the front end page that you're editing. Um, but like uh, when I see hacks, I, I, I want to have the ability to like control my publishing settings, you know, like, oh, this is when this thing should be published or, you know, schedule it or set all of the other things that are mm -hmm. on the node at the same time as I'm, I want to edit, 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 and I want to configure the publishing options all at once, you know? Uh, and I, I'm not quite sure how to resolve that. And I'm curious if you've had any thoughts around how hacks could be used in like a uh, in a backend sense, like on the node edit screen or bring in the node edit screen to the front end so that you can display it alongside hacks. Like what kind of ideas have you had around that? So the second one is obviously more complicated, right? Loading the, the node edit screen on the front end because in doing it in a platform agnostic way, I should say, right? If Hacks isn't supposed to care about this other stuff. Um, we did have one, one group that was basically brought up the exact same thing. Um, now, on the one hand, if you use the classic press or WordPress or Grav integrations, you are actually on their version of the node edit form. And it just basically hijacks tiny MCE. Um, so it's not that that is impossible. You could, you could definitely do it that way. Um, or I could do it that way, whoever. <laughs> is, that, is, that like within an, is that within an iframe to like uh, load it all in its own location? I guess no, most, um, most things are within iframes, you know, the WYSIWYGs. The nice, so the, the CK editor has to do iframes, but the nice thing with what we're doing because of all the shadow roots, we actually get some of the advantages of an iframe as far as encapsulation, but without using iframes everywhere. So um, the way the tiny MC integration works in WordPress is it lets tiny MC start to load, scrapes it off and then uses because tiny MC just loads on top of a text area. So then it just loads the hacks tag and takes the text area content and injects it into the hacks tag. So then you're actually editing it the exact way that it would be presented in that context. Now in WordPress and classic press, I can kind of screw stuff up a little bit because their backend system has different CSS. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, you could also, you know, iframe it in context or whatever. Um, I, I mean, ultimately I want another, I want a tab that um, uh, the backdrop integration doesn't have this just yet, but the WordPress and Drupal 8 integration, the D8 integration is the most robust because somebody paid for it, I think. Um, it actually searches the entity system. So you can search like images that are the media type of that, you know, of an image. And then when you upload an image, it actually uploads it and stores it as a media entity. So then you're going through search and you're dragging and dropping the media entities in place, which I think starts to get a little closer to this notion of like you're describing with the like, oh, I want these fields. It'd be awesome if those fields were in a UI element and it said, oh, here are the available fields so that you could drop them on. And then when you modify them, we save and then something in the back end, you know, specific to that platform goes, oh, whenever I see a 
you know, CMS hyphen field tag, and it has this, you know, no, this identifier name that matches my field name, take that tag, we're going to trust it in this case to supplant the value and then update the associated, you know, timestamp or whatever. Um, yeah. I'm okay, totally so open to that stuff. So yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's just, it's, it certainly requires effort. <laughs> All right, well, I, I've cornered you on questions, but does anybody else uh, have anything they'd like to ask? It looks really interesting as an alternative to trying to build all these things in paragraphs. Because I've been experimenting with backdrop with using the block layout system to create certain types of interfaces that somebody could easily edit versus creating custom paragraphs that they could insert in a page. But it's it requires a lot of work on the back end and it's and in the styling too you end up creating you know these custom css um files that you know are targeting your paragraphs and it's it's very technical and and that's the thing that really i'm trying to avoid because i, I want to be able to hand this off to people that are less technical and, and the one thing that looked really impressive was that that ui you know it, it gives people a lot of options to really work with their information and to change things well the problem with paragraphs even in drupal is that once you put something in a per certain type of format, you can't get it out. You know, if you created it as so and so widget, you have to copy and paste the content to put it into something else. You know, and that that is not something that an average user really wants to do. Um, you know, they'll just stop using the tool um, rather than you know fighting with it. So uh, it looks like there's really some you know, from the way you were using it, that there might be, you know, opportunities to use this kind of an interface instead to really make a better user experience, but give them a ability to really put together a custom page and change things around. Um, yeah, and I mean, the uh, if, if we are to kill one construct, just from, again, seeing it at Penn State at scale and going like, oh crap, I didn't really think about painting us into that corner, it's the paragraphs nightmare that it is for the, per not for usually the consultants <laughs> and not for the people that build the infrastructure. It makes a lot of sense, but for then handoff and then being, right. uh, seeing the other side of the equation where it's like, oh, sweet, we, we at fill in the blank company I can't name, handed you this $600,000 website and it's built in paragraphs. And now you can have $100,000 training in how to use paragraphs. And don't worry, paragraphs changes between Drupal versions and it actually has nothing to do with the real web. It's just a made up concept. So then you've got your data modeling, capturing stuff to allow people to do front end UI logic. And we made the grid plate tag like two years ago. And then we don't think about that anymore. Like that's the beauty of, if, if, if we name things semantically um, and it's, it meets our use case and we push it out and we have a consistent way to leverage it over and over again, we don't ever think about that idea anymore. Um, like Nikki, um, like accessibility and like color contrast, total, like there's units at, at my university dedicated to ensuring accessibility as there should be, but they'll go and do trainings nonstop about like, now when you have, um, when you have white text on the back, when you have white background, make sure that there's enough contrast with that black text, which makes sense, but that is a mathematical situation. So we have um, a, a subclass called simple colors and that's simple colors job is to just make sure that the contrast ratio between things is logical. So um, it, any of our tags, like our video player or um, stop note, we have a, a whole bunch of other ones that leverage it. If you say accent hyphen color equals orange, it is gonna guarantee that that looks a hue of orange, but that it is meeting uh, WCAG uh, 3.0 AA, I believe is what we try to target, uh, accessibility guidelines. And the end user that made that change didn't have to think or know what any of the things I just said are, which is what we're ultimately trying to do. Um, you know, If that's a link, like government links are supposed to when you click to an external site, pop up a modal and say like, hey, you're leaving our property, right? There's NGOs and other places that have that requirement. In my mind, that's an easy win web component. Don't have users make, you know, a href equals whatever, because they don't know that you're actually supposed to put rel equals no opener, no follow, right? As a, it's, it's actually, uh, I think Google Lighthouse dings you if your links don't have that in it anymore. 
So what that does is it pops the thing open in a new window and it makes sure that there's no actual data leakage between the two. So we make a web component called like gov hyphen external link. And then that behavior just occurs. Then we've used gov hyphen external link 10,000 times across 10,000 sites. We no longer care where it's used because we have that trace uh, and the accountability back to that definition. So as long as we never change that definition, no matter where it's used in a body field, in a field that's rendered out and spit through a template, if we pre reprogram the CDN to say, oh, well now the definition is this, or hell, it's not a CDN, it just sits at, you know, cites all libraries web components, then we're basically in progressive enhancing our content after the fact without having to go and nitpick and find, oh, where's that link where we use that class name? We have to change that class name everywhere. Like we just, we don't think about stuff like that anymore. It's incredibly liberating. <laughs> so I'm glad you picked up on the paragraphs parallel because I, yeah, this is my paragraphs death. Uh, it was really trying to make, you know, to give the users more power, but make the interface simple. And, and just as you're saying, you know, the users, I don't want them to have to learn that, you know, they have to like style things a certain way or, you know, and, with CK editor, you create custom widgets and things, but that's like its whole other, like, you know, development maintenance. And even then you use a lot of limitations and, you know, it's only going to work in certain versions and really getting something to abstract that out and just give the user the minimal they need to enter. But, you know, that they can say, I know I need to do it to do this. And then, but really have a lot of that stuff behind the scenes sounds really great. I mean, that's part of the reason I'm trying to move to backdrop from the Drupal 7 and Drupal 8 sites that I'm maintaining. And, you know, we also have a lot of WordPress sites. I'm in a university too. So we have things that we control in the tech side, and then we have other groups that just go off and do their own thing. And it would be great to also be able to give them standard components that, you know, basically they could plug in for certain things we want to make sure are presented a certain way. Um, and that's the one thing that in like Drupal, um, you know, you'd have to create your custom paragraph. You have to get them to, you know, build it. And, you know, if you have a different theme or a different install, you have to customize it for that. Mm -hmm. and, and really that universality, of, you know, especially even beyond Backdrop or Drupal, you know, because we are going to get people to use WordPress or we have other, you know, programs that people use to build their sites. You know, they find X program to build sites out. But if we can give them things and for Backdrop, you know, I'm, I'm looking at this, you know, the, really the focus on the user is the big thing that's brought me to it, plus taking a lot of the, the good things we had in Drupal 7. But, you know, still, I found that, you know, like the, the layout builder and the blocks and everything, that whole mindset is still hard for basic users that, you know, I, I think that's something, it's, it's evolving and getting better. But, you know, a lot of times people, certain people just need to focus on the content, but they need to be able to do different types of content not just one fixed type. So that's where this really could help, I think. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, that's, I mean, that's part of why I, like I don't run any backdrop sites, but I promote backdrop and I show it working and I maintain the integrations and stuff because I know that the focus of this community is on, you know, the mom and pop shop, if you will, like, hey, these people need websites too. Hey, not everybody's a multi-billion dollar corporation that's gonna sell you a bill of goods, in my opinion, if it's, paragraphs. But yeah, I mean, um, part of the, so we actually, I picked up this approach, the components sitting in one location, populating lots of things from BYU. Um, so BYU has webcomponents.byu.edu. And they use that just to document branding elements. And mm -hmm. it was one of those, like someone having an off, an, an odd conversation with me about something else. And they're just, oh yeah, yeah, we use web components. I was like, oh, use it for what? And they're like, oh, well, like the if you go to a website like the BYU hyphen logo, that's, that's a web component. And I was like, really? And they're like, yeah, we have like 26 and uh, we don't learn templating languages anymore. And I was like, uh. and they just, and you know, they're on to the next thing. I'm like, no, 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 can you show me what the heck you're talking about? <laughs> Cause like I have tons of teams invested in templating languages and they can't talk to each other because you know, I don't want to, I, I don't want people to move from Drupal to Backdrop, and then five years later go, oh, now we need to move from Backdrop to fill in the blank. And all of their stuff is not portable in any way, right? Now, I don't think they're gonna make that move because honestly, like no system on earth does views and views is still, and structured data is definitely where Backdrop and Drupal are king. 
but I also don't want to have to hire people or teach people what Twig is or get into templating languages specific to a platform like the isms, the Drupal isms or backdrop isms. Like I want that to be make a make this, you know, tag that we're going to use forever. Like, is this the agreed upon way we're going to do fill in the blank? If we can get to that, and you can't with everything, obviously. I mean, we also make lots of one-off tags too. <laughs> um, but anytime you can get to that, I think that's a huge win for your organization or for you working on multiple projects. Like I have an icon tag. Um, it's called, it's, uh, or sorry, Google made an icon tag called Iron Icon. And even just being able to semantically write, I want an icon named this is a huge win initially. Um, then like now, so, I mean, we've been doing web components and rolling these in production for about three years now. So now I'm going, oh, well, that element is written in Polymer element. Polymer element is an older way to do web components. It's, um, it's slower to re-render than lit element is way faster. And vanilla is faster than that. So I go, oh, well, now I'm going to do a, I'm going to make my own element. I'll call it simple hyphen icon. It'll have the same API to interface with it, but I'm going to give it a totally different definition. And so that's a simple search and replace across my portfolio once I get it in place. So, um, you know, whether it's fixing an accessibility issue at scale going, oh shoot, we got dinged on accessibility in the way that we present the icon, we should be doing alt text or whatever, or whether it's, you know, completely swapping out a tag after the fact, the fact that you can stack these components and other components like incentivizes abstraction, it incentivizes you to have like 50 tags and unfurl from one so that you can pinprick and modify any one of those or reuse them elsewhere. Um, like we don't think about modals anymore. I don't think about what the jQuery plugin is anymore. Like we don't interface with that stuff. Um, and it's incredibly liberating. Like I sleep much better other than nights where I have to stay up to, to talk to you, to you guys and have an awesome conversation. But um, I, on it, like legitimately, I sleep way better doing things this way. Cause I was going into, um, I had seven different installation profiles of Drupal and they would have like, you know, a card something dumb. It's like a card and it presents course data. Well, that course data is coming from slightly different backends in seven different places. And then I would fix an accessibility issue in one of them. And then we get ding six more times. And I wouldn't, it would, it, the knowledge didn't transfer. Like then I was going over and trying to figure out what the name of this template file is. Oh shoot. It's down here. Okay. And I'd have, I'd spend a whole day fixing that versus now I just have, you know, like our, stand you know simple card or whatever our card element is and that's in place and if we get dinged on it i update it in one place now i don't care who's used it where um now that you know you also have to make certain decisions internally and say i'm not going to change the api of this element like i i treat these as design assets and an api um which i don't know that everyone does but um, i especially think if we're trying to empower other people to do things in a way that we as developers can still sustain this is a really good way to be able to do that. Well, speaking of staying up late at night, I think we better wrap it up. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think for, for you, it's a lot. To, it's only what it's one one thirty here in, in the afternoon. But uh. <laughs> that sounds awesome. <laughs> but well, thanks, um, thanks, Brian, for giving this presentation. It's really informative. And you know, thank you for showing it. There. That was really helpful. Yeah, no problem. Um, Anytime. I, I had read about it, but I, I had never really looked until seeing it actually in, in use. It, it A lot of things clicked and a lot, there's a lot of things I want to go and try. So I'm definitely going to go and explore it and awesome, see man. what we can do with it. So. Well, we're, we're always just trying to get people on web components. So, you know, if you have any questions, you run into issues or want to know how, you know, our build routines work, all our tooling is open source. We've been been at this as a loss leader for a while. So <laughs> I think it's starting to finally pay off. Hit save.